Being a part of a rowdy theater group was like being with the crew of some chaotic circus. I threw myself in this cage as a half-ass buffoon, and I was almost swallowed whole. The only two things that kept me from quitting was the girl named Ella, which I dated for almost three years when we were in school. And I was actually pretty good at acting. I wasn't really into the art of acting when I first started though. I just decided to join the club when I saw Ella, whom I deeply admired, was in it. The activities and exercises were far more brutal than I expected. A person would need to have a pretty thick skin in order to survive a ton of criticism, yelling and insults. You have to be deliberately emotionally expressive for the sake of the roles assigned, and breaking the walls of my social defenses in order to express myself more freely was the hardest part at the beginning. It was emotionally and physically exhausting. The longer I stayed in it, the more I grew to enjoy it. Aside from being able to spend some time with Ella, I was receiving praises and it made me feel like I belonged there. Needless to say, I was doing my best at first just to impress the girl, but I ended up impressing the director and the audiences. The next thing I knew, we became a part of a small theater group led by the owner of an old theater house in a small city. His name was Sir Elward Valentin. He was a former actor that was actually pretty popular back in the day, but his reputation was later overshadowed by being a heavy-handed director and an egotistic playwright. Even so, to be part of an actual theater was a feat for us amateurs. We drove in without thinking twice and became his crew. Sir Valentin was quite an eccentric individual. He was a grumpy old man in his 60s who loved the theater more than learning how to properly behave in social situations. And despite his popularity, he never had any friends or even close acquaintances. Along with his awkward personality, he was known for bringing his methods of acting to a totally insane level. For instance, there was a time that he ate a live chicken during a play to portray his character, and rumors said that he did the same stunt at least three times during rehearsals. He was an owner of a very old and almost forgotten theater that looked like it was built in the 70s. The walls were not even painted and the tiles on the floor were still the original ones. They said that he had performed several plays in the same theater during his prime. And then he chose to buy the property on a whim, when this kind of entertainment was fading out of the picture. Aside from this dreary set, the sudden changes in his mood was a bit comical, to say the least. He would shout at the top of his lungs for just a very insignificant error during a practice. Then he would passionately applaud us on something that he was pleased at. The theater was only composed of ten people. Sir Valentin was the playwright and the acting director. He was very precise with how he wanted his stories to be interpreted, and his micromanaging further amplified this terror. There was only one person in charge of the costume designs. She was a lady in her late fifties named Tina that was working for this theater for years. There was also only one person that was in charge of the lights and audio, an old, mysterious man named Martin. Three from our group were chosen by Sir Valentine himself, me, Ella, and Randall. We were mixed into other actors and actresses that were probably handpicked as well. The other actors and actresses weren't quite welcoming. In fact, some were pretty direct to us told us that they didn't want us around, but those were actually not the worst kind. During our first plays, we were deliberately sabotaged in an attempt to put us on the sidelines permanently, or even hurt us physically, force us to quit. 
There was a time when Ella's costume was ruined just an hour before the act. Like it was shredded by scissors by more than just one person. So she ended up wearing a more revealing dress than how it ought to be. There were also instances that the props would not hold or were tampered with. Like how the mask I was supposed to wear had needles pinned inside it. These foul tactics were eventually downplayed when Randall decided to step in. He was quite a big man with a huge dominating voice, so they somehow feared that he would retaliate on our behalf. Even though I didn't condone it, I understood why some of these individuals decided to get aggressive. Young bloods like us just suddenly appeared, and I for one were already being handed good roles, while those of us who had been bearing with the bad conditions in this theater for a longer time were just set aside. Our salary was horrible and highly unstable. The amenities for being this theater's talents were non-existent. But in spite of this difficult situation, having a role under Sir Valentine's wing would look pretty good on an application. They wanted to eliminate strong competitors in any way they could. Everybody was fighting to be the center of attention and for the glory of the limelight. Now despite all of the horrible things I experienced when I was there, there were a few really good moments that I deeply cherished. Valentine's Midnight Theater eventually became my second home, aside from getting used to the unhealthy competition surrounding me. Ella and I became lovers and we eventually moved in a small apartment together. Everybody knew that the theater wasn't doing so well. It was barely making ends meet, and a big part of the reason why it had led to this was the lack of sponsorship. Sir Valentine's reputation as a very unapproachable individual was driving investors and customers away. Until one rainy night during our rehearsal, an unexpected visitor suddenly walked in. I was placing buckets under the leaks on the roof when the strange man wearing a long black coat and a tall hat slowly walked past me, and it seemed as if he brought the cold winds of the rain with him as I suddenly felt chills crawling down my arms. The rain was pouring hard outside, and yet he was completely dry. His face was covered by the long collars of his coat. Aside from the tattered scarf wrapped around his neck and up to his mouth, he approached the stage as if he was just gliding in the air, slowly and silently. One of the actors on the stage that was currently rehearsing approached him, and I could see on his face that he was spooked. He asked for Sir Valentine. The strange man took a short glance around the theater as he was just standing at the side of the stage, and it was then that I somehow saw part of his face. His left eye had a cataract, and there were a number of deep scars from his hairless brow line and down to his cheek. And a few moments later, he was escorted to Sir Valentine's office. Almost an hour passed before the strange man walked out of the room and out of the theater. One of us tried to follow him to lend him an umbrella, since it was still raining hard. But he said that the mysterious guy just vanished. He followed him almost right after he walked out, and it was impossible that he wouldn't catch him. A few minutes later, Sir Valentine walked out of his office and gathered us at the stage. Apparently, the strange visitor wanted to sponsor us, but he had a few conditions. He wanted it to be as realistic as it could be, and he wanted us to give all that we got for this play. As Sir Valentine was briefing us with the details, I noticed that he was acting quite odd. Now, I couldn't point out exactly what it was, but I felt like there was something very wrong. He couldn't look us straight in the eyes, and it seemed he was deeply bothered by something. After the briefing, he turned his back and uttered a very strange, strong statement. 
He said that this play would undoubtedly be the most popular story that he had ever created. His words would be meaningless if it came out from other playwrights since it was often told carelessly just to promote their materials, but coming from Sir Valentine, I knew that he meant every single word. Just two days after the odd visit, the first rehearsal was scheduled. When I woke up that day, Ella was no longer with me in the apartment. We usually head to the theater together. I tried to call her, but he wasn't answering her phone. I called Randall as well, but his phone was oddly out of reach. I headed to the theater then, assuming that she went there before me. There was a large wooden trunk at the side of the entrance, but I paid no attention to it and just walked towards the stage. For some reason... The spotlights were the only lights that were lit. All of them were pointed at the stage, and everywhere else was dark, as if an actual show was currently happening. There was a person waiting for me at the stage at that time, and I climbed up so I could ask him if he saw Ella, but instead of answering my question, he handed me the new script. I disregarded the notes first and asked what was going on, we should only be reading the dialogues first before we proceed to act them out. Oddly enough, the actor told me that I had already recited the first two lines. Because of what he said, I decided to read it. Act number one, first sequence. The hero arrives and searches for his damsel. He walks toward the light and asks the person he sees, Have you seen Ella? Failing to receive the desired response, he asks this person again, What is going on? Everything that I would inevitably do and say was written there, including the argument that I was about to have with the person on stage because of this seriously messed up situation. Even the line when I would curse him and tell him to stop following the script was indicated. I unconsciously uttered all the lines, the reactions were all natural. Because of this, the first thing I did was to read ahead. If everything was written down, it would mean that the end of the story, or at least the end of the first act, would be indicated on the script as well. All I would need to do was not follow through and intercept the sequences. But I was tricked. All the pages handed to me were the same copy of the first act. At that point, I was already enraged, but even that was written on the page. Just as I read the lines, a spotlight shone at the trunk that I ignored at the entrance. I walked back to it and reached inside, as I was said to do also in the script. Inside the trunk was a smaller wooden stash, and inside the stash was a loaded pistol. I was bound to do the following sequences written on the page. What was written there was exactly how I would naturally react in the situation. I was bound to confront Valentine and ask him what the hell he was up to. And those were the last lines written on the page that I had. Without any warning, I kicked the door open and held up the gun. Valentine was way out of line this time and he deserved to be threatened. But nobody was inside his office. All that I found was another page of the script. Act 2. The Search The hero fails to see the man he wishes to speak to. The gun has no target. He finds the next leaf of clues laid on the table, but as he skims lines on the page, he realizes that the missing damsel was far from reach. He discovers a latch under the carpet of the office table, and there he sees a hatch that might lead him to what he is looking for. Now, I never knew there was this much room underneath the theater. And nobody probably did. They were only allowed to enter Valentine's office when we were called to do so. The paragraphs next to this clue was just an elaboration of what I was feeling after seeing the hatch and going inside it. Rather than dictating what I should feel, it was actually describing it precisely. 
word for word. The panic, the helplessness of being totally clueless, the pressure, and the growing concern for Ella. The underground path only led to a cellar. There was nobody there. The first thing I noticed was the drops of blood on the floor, and another page of the script for the sick prank that Valentine was trying to pull. Act 3 The hero discovers blood drops on the floor of the dusty cellar, and this causes him to panic, as he thinks that this blood might belong to his damsel. He realizes that he should head back as fast as he could, and there he will see the face of the protagonist for the first time, and something else that he isn't expecting. And that was it. Nothing else followed. And so I did. I ran and climbed back to the office as fast as I could. Once again, the third page described what I exactly felt. I pulled out my phone and I was about to call the police. I should have done this earlier. But I was having doubts since it could just be a prank I could probably forgive. But the drops of blood I found on the cellar meant that someone was hurt. And I feared that it might be Ella. Either if it was a sick prank or not, it had gone too far. For some reason, I couldn't get any reception on my phone. I thought that the walls in Valentin's room might be blocking the signal, and so I headed out. The third act stated that I would finally see the protagonist of this mystery crime story that I was forced to be a part of, and something else that I wasn't expecting. For a theater actor like me, I had read a couple of crime stories and other tragedies, and I was trying to predict the different twists that could be applied to this kind of scenario, and what I could do to work my way around them. But what I saw then was far more horrific than the scenarios that I had imagined. The hallway that led to Valentin's office was at the side of the stage. Coming from that angle, I would see the backstage first before I got to the front. I thought that I must have missed it before since I was in a panic and all I thought about was confronting Valentin to force him to tell me where Ella was. For the second time that I passed, I immediately smelled the scent of blood. Lurking in the shadows of the backstage was Randall lying on the floor, bleeding to death with an axe in his hand. And around him were the bodies of four other actors and actresses of the theater, including the one I spoke to, brutally hacked and dismembered. They had knives in their hands and their scripts in the other. Just a few seconds after my arrival, Randall, with a number of stab wounds and deep lacerations all around his body, drew his last breath with a blank stare. This horrendously shocking scene right in front of me seemed so unreal. I was overwhelmingly shocked that I couldn't even make a sound come out of my mouth. I was choking as every inch of me was shaking. As I walked across this puddle of blood that came from both enemies and friends, I grabbed one of the scripts lying on the floor. It was Randall's. Act 3. To Slaughter The hero is led to the back of the stage in search of his friends that he feels are in danger. But instead of saving, it is him who is placed in a dire situation and needs to be saved. He was given a different script and a totally different scenario. The sequences were written in a way that wouldn't run into each other as we attended to these scenes, that were forced on us. Ellen and I were used as a bait so Randall would be forced to do what he did. I was led to the cellar so I wouldn't be at the location while Randall was killing and being killed. As I tried my best to gather my senses, I walked away from the back of the stage to look for Ella. I feared that she was given a different script as well and was forced to do something unimaginably horrible. And I was right. As I walked around from the back, 
I saw Ella at the stage with her clothes, drenched in blood. However, the blood wasn't hers. With a dagger in her hand, she kept on stabbing the man lying on the floor in front of her, who was long dead. I called her name, but she did not hear me. I slowly climbed up the stage, terrified. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Tears started to flow down across my face as fear stopped me in my tracks. She was not reacting to my presence. She didn't seem like herself at all. Her face was full of malice and anguish as she was slicing this man to shreds as if she were possessed. And this barely recognizable man was, unexpectedly, Valentine himself. I couldn't even begin to imagine what she was forced to do that made her lose her sanity completely. And why was this man that made all of this happen end up being brutally killed at the center of his own stage? Needless to say, I couldn't think clearly. After all that I have seen, my sanity was also fading off of me. These gory scenes seemed like they could only occur in a horrible nightmare, like fictional portions of mystery, thriller, and horror stories. I raised my hand and held up the gun. I pointed it at Ella and I placed my finger on the trigger. I wanted to end this nightmare, but I just couldn't bring myself to kill her. Instead, I pointed the gun against my head, but I couldn't do that as well. I fell on my knees as I lost all my strength and I dropped the gun to the floor. Then suddenly, there was a huge wave of applause that came from the seats. I was blinded by the spotlights, but I could see the silhouettes of people clapping their hands in the crowd. As my sight adjusted with the brightness, the claps diminished and only a single pair of hands remained. It was the strange visitor who came on that rainy night wearing a black coat and a tall hat. He was the one who wanted this tragic play. He was the root of it all. Sir Valentin then walked out from the back of the stage. My jaw dropped. Ella stood up and held a look-alike dummy of Sir Valentin in her hands. The crowd cheered loudly as the other actors got up and walked to the edge of the stage to take a bow. It was truly a magnificent play. The crowd was watching my every move in the office and basement through hidden cameras that were streamed on newly installed flat screens that were turned off when I had originally walked in. I was so focused on finding Ella, a part of Valentine knew that I would be. It was all perfect 